Hi everybody, Justin here from chemistrynotes.com and this is our second video on section 7, the quantum mechanical view of the atom and periodicity. Now in the last video we talked about uh, some of the properties of light and how light can travel as a wave and how uh, light has a frequency and a wavelength. Today we're going to start to explore the wave particle duality of light. So before we do that, we first have to have some background on the nature of matter. So page one of our notes right here at the top, it says the nature of matter. In the early 1900s, Max Planck discovered that matter cannot absorb or emit just any amount of energy. Now remember, matter is an object that has mass and takes up space. Light, which we talked about last video, light does not have mass. So light is not matter. This is a new topic today. So in the early 1900s, Max Planck discovered that matter cannot absorb or emit just any amount of energy. Instead, he postulated that energy can only be gained or lost in little impulses or some little finite packages or whole number multiples of the quantity h nu. Remember, h is Planck's constant from last video, and that little cursive v is the Greek symbol nu, and that is frequency, okay? So what can we say about h nu? We can say that the change in energy, delta E, is calculated by the following equation in the box. Delta E equals n h nu. And the n is the integer, one, two, three, etc. h is Planck's constant, which is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th joule seconds. Frequency, as we learned in the last video, is seconds to the minus one, or hertz. And that's the same thing as a cycle per second. Now, because energy is transferred, and it says this in the first paragraph up there, because energy is transferred, in other words, absorbed or emitted in these finite quantities, or these little packets of multiple h nu, okay? Because energy is transferred, in other words, absorbed or emitted in these finite quantities or packets of energy, the entire, I'm sorry, the energy is said to be quantized. So it's kind of like walking up the steps to, if you go from the first floor to the second floor and you walk up a series of steps, right? You're not gradually walking up an incline, you're walking up a series of finite elevations called steps. That's the little, pat. each step is a packet of energy or a packet of step. So let's do an example to help make sense of this. What quantum of energy is emitted by CuCl? This would be copper one chloride, right? What quantum of energy is emitted by CuCl at a wavelength of 450 nanometers? So we're trying to find an amount of energy, a quantum of energy, and they're giving us the wavelength. So they're giving us that little wishbone, that little lambda Greek symbol that we learned about in the first video, which was S7E1. So the equation we have from the last page is delta E equals NH nu. Or because we're just looking, we're trying to find out the quantum or the packet or the, the multiple of energy, we're really just looking for h nu, we don't need to find n, so our n will be one, okay? Delta E equals h nu. I'm dropping the n because I'm just looking for the, the packet amount. Essentially, I'm trying to find out how tall is each step in my staircase. So that's called my packet or my quantum. And uh, nu is the, is the symbol for frequency, which is the little cursive v. Now we can get that from the wavelength. So from the last uh, episode we did, the last video, we know that lambda nu equals c, where c is the speed of light, 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. I've divided by the wavelength that has been converted into meters from nanometers, right? There's 10 to the ninth nanometers for every one meter. So if I do that math right there, I end up with a frequency of 6.66 times 10 to the 14th seconds to the minus one. So kind of an ominous number, huh? Just by circumstance, nu or frequency equals 6.66 times 10 to the 14th hertz. Now I put it into the equation, delta E equals H nu. 
In other words, delta E equals Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th joule seconds times the frequency, and I get an energy value of 4.41 times 10 to the minus 19th joules. So what does that mean? Well, it means a sample of CUCL emitting light at 450 nanometers can only lose energy in those increments of 4.41 times 10 to the minus 19th joules. Okay? All right, let's move on from Max Planck, and we'll move to, uh, I believe this is page three of today's notes. It says, Einstein continued with Planck's research, which we just talked about in the last few pages. Einstein continued with Planck's research above and suggested that EMR, we learned in the last video that EMR is electromagnetic radiation, or loosely phrased as light, Einstein continued with Planck's research and suggested that EMR or light can exhibit the same types, the same type of behavior as, as exhibited by matter. So here for the first time we're starting to see that matter, in other words an object, like an electron, like an atom, like, like a baseball, matter is exhibiting wave-like behavior and we're also going to notice that light can exhibit particle-like behavior. So light, we usually think of as traveling in a wave. It can also travel as a particle. Depends on how you want to perceive it. Particles, like a baseball, we don't really, we think of them as traveling in a linear path, a particle-like movement. But actually, all types of matter can also move in waves. So this is where we get this wave-particle duality of light and also of matter, okay? So let's make that, what that bullet point say there, the arrow says, Einstein, proposed that EMR can be viewed as a stream of particles called photons. A stream of particles is a movement that's kind of linear, okay? It's kind of horizontal or any directional one-way movement. Einstein proposed that EMR, or light, which we learned in the last video, travels as a wave. It can also be viewed as a stream of particles, and those streams of particles are called photons. Photons are just a packet or a quantum of light. Now this led to, star right there in the middle of the page, it says this led to the wave-particle duality of light. Now the wave-particle duality of light is a phenomenon in which light can exhibit both wave-like and particle-like behavior. So the energy of a photon, okay, remember a photon is a packet or a quantum of light of EMR, so there's no mass associated with it. But the energy of a photon is equal to h nu, which is also equal to hc over wavelength. Now, h and c are both constants. Okay? Now, after Einstein's wave-particle duality of light, so Einstein's working on this wave-particle duality of light. Okay? After he's working on that, scientists, including a guy by the name of de Broglie, his name is spelled D-E-B-R-O-G-L-I-E. -E. Scientist by the name of de Broglie, he follows up and begins considering whether or not matter can also travel the way that light travels as far as a wave is concerned. So you got Einstein wondering if light can travel like a particle, like a stream of particles called photons. And then you got de Broglie in the other room wondering if matter can act as a wave or as a particle, okay? So light and matter traveling as both waves and particles, they're kind of both being discussed in the same, kind of in the same area, right? So matter, previously thought to behave and travel through space as a particle, can also show wave-like characteristics. Light, originally thought to travel exclusively like a, as a wave, shows properties of traveling like particles. Now look at matter. Matter, which is previously thought to travel only as like in a stream of particles, can also be considered traveling in a wave. So they're both kind of coming together and having this wave-particle duality of light. De Broglie, he found a relationship between mass and wavelength. Now what has mass, light or matter? Certainly not light, right? So mass, so this equation right here, the De Broglie equation, is for matter. So we have in the box wavelength equals h 
over mv. Now that's v as in velocity. That's not a little cursive v. That is not the frequency. So the wavelength equals h over mv. m is mass in kilograms. Velocity is meters per second. Remember, that's not frequency. Okay. Now this equation only refers to uh, objects or matter. This is not an equation for light. Light does not have mass. So let's do an example. Compare the wavelength for an electron, tiny, tiny, tiny little electron. Compare the wavelength for the smallest little electron uh, with a mass of 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, traveling at a speed of 1.0 times 10 to the seventh meters per second with that for a ball, like a baseball. So we have a little, little electron versus a big, huge baseball or ball. That ball has a mass of 0 0.10 kilograms traveling at 35 meters per second. Two totally different ideas of what matter is here. Okay, here is matter, the submicroscopic level. That's the electron, that's on the left. Wavelength equals HMV. For the ball on the right, wavelength equals HMV. For the electron on the left, wavelength is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th, divided by the electron mass, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilogram, also divided by the electron velocity, 1.0 times 10 to the seventh meters per second. Now for the ball, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th joule seconds, divided by a very large mass of 0 0.10 kilogram, divided by a very large speed of 35 to the meter, 35 meters per second. Now with the ball, the denominator is going to be huge compared to the, to the denominator of my electron. So the wavelength for my electron is 7.27 times 10 to the minus 11th meters. The wavelength for my ball is much, 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 much smaller. 1.9 times 10 to the minus 34th meters. Now, when you think of a baseball at a baseball game, the pitcher's not throwing the ball in some wavy corkscrew looking thing. Visibly, it looks like a stream. A particle visibly would look like a wave. And that's what I'm writing underneath here. Underneath where it says wavelength of electron, I'm writing long enough wavelength that the electron can actually be seen traveling as a wave. Now, the wavelength of the ball is so, so, so small that it says here is very short wavelength. So much, it's much too, much too small to be seen traveling as a wave. So it's a very short wavelength, so much so that it actually is viewed traveling as a particle. Imagine these waves being so tight as it moves, it basically just looks like it's moving as a stream. Okay, so I've got that little squiggly line there with just waves, but over time it just looks like a straight trajectory or a straight movement across whatever orbit it's taking. Okay, so it really all comes down to the wavelength or frequency or energy of the item that's moving, whether it's an electron or whether it's a ball. The larger the object, the straighter its trajectory as far as we can see. All right, one last topic in today's video before we close up shop here today and that is the photoelectric effect. Photoelectric effect, definition. It's the observation that many metals can emit electrons when light shines on them. So if you impact a metal with uh, light, in other words, H nu, E equals H nu, energy in the form of light. If you impact a metal surface with enough energy or at a certain, enough, or a certain level of frequency, you can emit or eject electrons from the metal surface. That's the photoelectric effect. So what it says here in our notes is it's the light used to, it says the light used to dislodge the electrons must have a high enough energy. You have to hit the metal with a high enough energy such that you overcome something called the threshold frequency. So let me back up here and just reread what it says in our notes. The light used to dislodge the electrons must have a high enough energy such that, it, such that it meets or exceeds something called the threshold frequency. Okay, If the frequency is high enough that it's up and over the threshold frequency, then the energy will be high enough because energy and frequency are directly, re directly related by E equals H nu, that equation that we had boxed up earlier. So. Regarding threshold frequency, 
it says here, a single photon must have enough energy or enough of a frequency to dislodge an electron, which is bound to the metal with a binding energy equal to the Greek symbol phi. Now that is not the number zero. That is not a value of zero there, okay? That is a Greek symbol phi, P-H-I. That's binding energy. So the threshold frequency condition is the following. The energy, H nu, has to be greater than or equal to the binding energy. If you can overcome the binding energy of electron, that's the energy that the, holds the electron to the metal, overcome that binding energy and you'll be able to eject the electron because you've overcome the binding energy. So the energy, or the, I'm sorry, the frequency related with that energy is called threshold frequency. And as long as H nu is greater than or equal to the binding energy, we can get the electron to emit or to get ejected from the metal. All right, so that's it for this video. Hopefully uh, I'll see you next time. My website is chemistrynotes.com. All journal chemistry notes are there and all organic chemistry notes are there. So I'll see you for the next video.